Welcome back to the Bordreau Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Kyle Bradburn, and with me is my co-host, Matt Dixon. And tonight, we have a special guest, Coach Daryl Sutherland, formerly with Bartram Trail High School and kind of a legend here in North Florida. So, Coach Sutherland, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me on. <laughs> yeah, we finally got sound effects. This is our first time doing it. Um, so real quick, uh, everyone listening, I always ask coaches to send me their accolades prior to the podcast. Coach Sutherland is maybe one of the most humble guys I've been around for as good as he is. He sends me three lines. Coach for 31 years, five in uh, Shellsville High School in Virginia, um, three at Bridgewater College, and 23 at Bartram Trail. He's been married for 32 years, has three kids, and he's taught English reading and Bible classes. That's the only thing Coach Sutherland sent me. And when we start to talk about him here, guys, you're going to realize why that's uh, a characteristic of coach and and how fantastic he's been and how humble of a coach he is for how much he's succeeded in this uh, in this field, if you will. So, coach, is there any way you could give us a little more background on you, Um, kind of what you've done at Bartram Trail? I appreciate that. It's very very kind of you, your comments there. So I appreciate that. (laughs) I'd say one of the best things and I'm being serious about it. One of the best things I've done is hire really, really good people. And and honestly, I can't even take credit for that. Uh, The good Lord has blessed me with some great coaches. Uh, one of the coolest things, too, is how many of the guys uh, that are currently coaching at Bartram or the last few years there that were former players. And just so fun to see them come back. And a lot of them are teachers there at the school. Um, you know, uh, their their kids are around the campus all the time. And uh, just getting to coach with those guys that were able to come up seeing what the program, what we wanted it to be. And those guys really embodied it as players and then as uh, young men and then now as, as uh, men and coaches and guys and that are influences on campus. It's just an awesome blessing to get to see that. Yeah, Coach. And I, I've been actually a witness of it. I have not only lost you as a player, but I've lost you as a coach a few times as well. So I've definitely seen the the full kind of circle of Bartram Trail uh, from when I was in high school and you guys opened up and, and Bishop Kenny came out there and we, we got it taken to us all the way to when I was coaching and, and got it taken to us a few times. So I've been on the uh, the odd end of you quite a few times, but always loved the battles. It was always fun to play Bartram. We had, we had some great ones. Um, it, and it's so funny when I talk about Bartram Trail, and I, I mean this in the most respectful way, I hate Bartram Trail. I hated everything about him. And then I would go and listen to you at a clinic, and I'm like, man, I love this guy. He <laughs> talks, and I want to listen, but I also just want to compete, and I want to beat him. And it, it's so crazy how much respect you can have for a competitor. And you were one of those coaches that was like, Man, I, I don't have a bad word to say about that guy, but but man, I really want to beat Bartram. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate the, the the feelings are mutual, so I appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, just for it, those, oh, sorry, go ahead, coach. I was just say it's crazy. The the last few years, we actually had uh, sons of former players and things like that that were coming through, and just uh, I was like, boy, that really ages you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's pretty wild because, coach, you opened Bartram Trail, correct? You were the first coach there. I was. Well, actually, I guess technically I shared this. With, we, I don't remember how this came up the other day, but I was actually their second choice. They hired a guy from up north. Uh, and when he came down, his wife didn't like it, didn't like the area. And so I did a better job selling my wife on it. And uh, <laughs> so I, I was, uh, like I said, divine intervention in a lot of ways. It was awesome how, uh, you know, God opened the door and we love it here. That's pretty awesome. And, and coach, you've really become a staple of this community. So tonight we're going to talk about uh, how I've titled it is the blueprint of a winning culture. And um, anyone who knows you around here knows about the culture in your program and how you guys were so successful for so long. So we're going to jump into it here and just going to start off by asking, can you can you really share your perspective on what constitutes a high level culture within a high school football program? Well, I, that's a that's a big question. There's a lot of different ways right to, to, to go with the answer. I, you know, I think it's a it's a you know, kind of a recipe of a few things. One, one of the key things is that uh, coaches feel like they have the opportunity to contribute. You know, you get guys there that uh, that want to uh, come and do something to make the program better and then giving them the opportunity to do that and stepping out of their way, giving them the resources uh, that they need to do it. Uh, but you know, when I was up at Bridgewater, I was the strength and conditioning guy. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I really love strength and conditioning. We got down here at Bartram, I was started off doing it and then was able to hire guys that were better at it than I was and recognizing, Hey, that, you know, some things that they're doing a little bit differently than I would have done it. And I just needed to step back and go that that's good. Um, you know, that different perspective, a different way of doing it. Uh, we've all got the same in game in mind and that's about the development of young men. Uh, 
uh, that whether it was our summer program or whether it was the, uh, you know, the fall season, spring season, our winter uh, conditioning or our winter team building or leadership building stuff, it needed to all be at the same focus of developing the best young men that we can. I'm a firm believer that better young men are better football players. Uh, count on them. They're going to do the right things on and off the field. They're going to have integrity with practice. Uh, so that was a big part of what we were trying to build. And just, you know, so finding coaches that that was their aim uh, and then giving them the resources they needed uh, so that they could go do that. Yeah, absolutely, Coach. And in there, you're talking about those things. Everyone always has pillars of their programs or core values or something that they deem kind of with that, you know, that phrasing, if you will. What were the core values of, you know, your program at Bartram? Well, the, there were really two ways that we went about it. One, you know, uh, th that old adage of you can say a thousand things one time or one thing a thousand times. We kept trying to come back to, OK, how do we get the, the one thing or just a couple of things that we want? Every player, doesn't matter who comes on campus and asks them, hey, what's your football program about? What do you guys stand for? Something like that. We wanted our players to all know the answer. Uh, and so we came up with the uh, um, BTHS for our, you know, for our, our school letters. Uh, and the B was brotherhood. And I really like doing, you know, kind of cheesy motivational things. <laughs> so when I would say brotherhood, the whole team would yell team before self. And so that was one of them, that idea of shared sacrifice of sweat equity, all those things, but really about doing what's better for your teammates than necessarily, you know, maybe even what's best for you. Yeah. Um, Cause that carried over so much. And then I loved really promoting that and recognizing it. You're know, the old recognize and reward what you want repeated. So anytime on film, we'd see somebody carrying out a fake and taking that safety of two extra steps and the running back being able to get through touchdown alley there because of the fake, we point out the fake. Uh, and, you know, make a bigger deal about that than the run itself or a guy hustling across the field to cut off the backside safety to get somebody, you know, get his teammate in the end zone. We started making a really big deal of all those things, whether it was practice film or, or game film, um, you know, pointing out guys doing team before self type things. Um, and then, uh, you know, we just went through each of those things. So, you know, we had the, um, the, you know, the idea of, of, of trying to make sure that the guys understood exactly what we wanted in each each one of those. That's good stuff, Coach. I, it makes a lot of sense, you know, obviously talking about those core values and talking about how you reward people. So it is uh, it's uh, very evident that you guys had that going there, and it was really a big piece of, of what you did there. Uh, Matt, I think you got the next question. Yeah, I got a, I got one for you. Um, <laughs> Coach, you were there for over 23 years, right, uh, at Bartram Trail High School. You know, and, you know, trying to build that strong team culture, you have certain things that come in the way. How did you sustain that positive culture in your time there over that amount of that length of a career? A lot of prayer. <laughs> um, yeah, I joked that, uh, you know, I had hair when we started. Um, and uh, but recognizing that that's part of it, that, uh, you know, every year you're getting a new cycle of players uh, and that uh, the things that you told the guys and that they started to understand last year. This group may not, and they're going to have their own growing pains. And sometimes the lessons have to be learned hard ways. Uh, and so just recognizing that, you know, you can't get frustrated with, you know, we, we've gone over this before. Well, you know, I went over that with the last year's group uh, and, you know, this year's group hasn't bought into it yet. And so just being patient with recognizing, you know, every year it's a new personality. Uh, hopefully a lot of the things carry over because your seniors own it. And uh, that was one of the things I was really just so excited about with our seniors was those guys buying into it every year and uh, recognizing that, uh, you know, we want uh, servant leaders. You know, we talk to them all the time about one of the most important words in leadership is let's, you know, so instead of, Hey, you go do this or, you know, getting on, uh, you know, calling people out, you call people up because you're doing it first. And now, Hey, let's go do this. Let's go pick the stuff up. Let's go put things away. Let's get water for the other guys. Uh, and recognizing that, um, you know, that the senior saying it, carries over a lot more than the coach is saying. Yeah, coach. So a lot of distractions nowadays, a lot of issues from either social media, players trying to transfer different places, uh, just a lot of things that could happen to your football program throughout a year. What advice would you give to a young coach trying to keep that positive culture going in house? I think just stay focused on the main things. Um, you know, I, I, you guys may have heard the story of the, you know, you build, build wells instead of fences, right? That if, uh, if you've ever seen, you know, 
growing up in Virginia and then coaching out in southwestern Virginia that with uh, with cattle all over the place, that if you have a, a good well, you have good grass, the cattle want to be there. Uh, if you don't, if you let the well dry up and you don't have good grass and they all want to go somewhere else, they're always now you got to worry about the fences and trying to keep people in instead. So uh, that was kind of our adage was just, hey, let's build a well, a good well, and let's keep making sure that guys are getting what they need here. Maybe not always what they want, but we're giving them what they need here. Uh, and if uh, if we could stay focused on that, I felt like that really helped keep burnout away. You know, instead of focusing on the things that were outside of our control, we'd focus on, well, let's just keep finding better ways to do what we want to do here, which is build great men. Yeah, absolutely. Coach, you know, I, I know we talked about players and earlier you talked about coaches, which is funny because, you know, we have this list of questions we ask guys. And as you're answering them, I'm already scratching off future questions. But can you dive more into talking about how you create that leadership and that approach on your coaching staff? Because I've talked to a lot of coaches that have worked with you. There's one thing they all say. They would run through a wall for you anytime. Every time I talk to those guys, they're like, look, because I, I hired really good men. <laughs> <laughs> they're always like, I don't care where he was coaching. If he asked me to go there, I would go there. They were like, it could be the worst job in the world. If he said, come there with me, I'm there. So talk a little bit about how you develop that relationship with your coaches and how you foster that. Cause clearly you've done a great job. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, that's, uh, like I say, I, I'm not just all shucks in it. I mean, that's, I, I really have was blessed just with great men that I got to work with. I love going to work every day. They made me better. Um, but I also, uh, I, I was really fortunate coming up, um, you know, that, uh, I worked for a guy at, at Bridgewater college, Mike Clark, who was my position coach in college actually. Um, and, um, he did a great job of giving us opportunities to take ownership of things, uh, and then trusting us with it and then trying to help us grow. He used to say at the beginning of every season, Hey, I want all of you guys to be head coaches, just not here. <laughs> so, uh, and that was kind of the way I took it was I, I you know, I want to help any of these guys that wanted to be head coaches. I want to be head coaches and uh, I want to do everything I can to help them if they want to step up to being coordinators or if they just want to be able to coach because uh, that, that's their, their way of giving back to their community and uh, their, their limit on what their time is going to be. I wanted to make sure that I gave them every opportunity to, you know, to realize their passion as well. Yeah. And I know, in the area, there's a few head coaches now that obviously come from from your tree, if you will, uh, that are around Jacksonville. So clearly, you've definitely done exactly what you just said, because uh, I can look around Jacksonville and see a handful of those guys. So um, absolutely. So go into a little bit about, you know, obviously, you, you've talked about trust and, and building this stuff. Do you have any like trust building activities or approaches that you found particularly effective with coaches and or players? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, you know, you can do some of the, the trust building type things uh, to to accelerate it. But for it to really be there and to be genuine, it's just it's, it takes time and it takes time. People seeing that you are going to do what you say you're going to do. Um, yeah. And, th- you know, there's no way to really accelerate that. Uh, and so with coaches, I love the fact that uh, you know, I was able to have a, a lot of the same coaches for a lot of years. Um, I think one of the things that we did that really helped was going on coaches trips, you know, so every spring we'd go visit a college, go spend some time watching their practice and meet with them. And, and the stuff that we learned from the college was important, but I don't think it was as important as the, the you know, 10 hour road trip and uh, the time in the hotel afterwards with the coaches all just hanging out and talking and really getting to know each other. Um, I, I think uh, with the coaches, them seeing that uh, that you really do care about them as men and you really do care about them as, as husbands and fathers, uh, that, uh, you know, it's easy to say, Hey, put your family first. But then when uh, somebody's kid has a dance recital and it's going to conflict with practice, do you, do you follow through and go, Hey, you need to go do the dance recital. Uh, we're going to, we'll pick up the stuff here and we'll be fine. Um, I think guys seeing that, uh, that you really mean what you say with that stuff. And I think the same thing with players, you know, being open and honest with them and, uh, them, seeing over the long haul that, that you really do care more about their growth as a man than you do about their growth as a player. Absolutely. Coach, I, you know, you talked about a road trip with other coaches. So I have a really important question here. What is your road trip snack of choice when you guys are on those road trips or you're on a long bus trip? Um, that's a good question. That's, uh, <laughs> we got the, I was actually, my, cause my, my youngest son is playing up at uh, Concord in West Virginia. And it's an eight and a half hour drive with no stops. Oh. And so I was selling them on the merits of, uh, of sunflower seeds because it keeps you busy. <laughs> and you got to figure out what you do with all the mess that uh, you're making and all that <laughs> stuff. That, that's, that's part of the, the, the trick of it keeping you awake. 
Yeah, a lot better than some coaches I know that were big on dipping. And then I had a coach one year that spilled his entire dip cup on me on the bus. And <laughs> <clears throat> on the bus ride, huh? Anyone yeah. that knows me and, and how fired up I get, it was not a good rest of the bus ride. So, And it was on the way to the game, not home. Oh, so that's it was a, intense. Uh, All right, Matt, go ahead. Hey, uh, coach, <laughs> um, you know, talking a lot about uh, building up programs and stuff, but a lot of times as head coaches – you see some sort of adversity, some sort of big thing come in the way where it seems like everything's going good in your season. And then, boom, something rears its ugly head. Is there any specific instance where you can talk about the team culture coming to uh, play a pivotal role in overcoming such adversity? Yeah, I, I think it really helps to address it before those things happen and just kind of explain to your guys, hey, we're going to have a, you know, Anytime you have adversity, you meet it, greet it, and defeat it. You you expect that it's going to come, and you just go. That's part of us. You know, one is part of relationships. Any any relationships, if you're around somebody long enough, you're going to have a disagreement, and so you figure out how to make it a positive thing. Uh, if we're trying to do great things as a team, people are, you know, that's the nature of team sports. Other people are going to try and prevent us from doing those things, and, and so that's you know that's part of it. How do we overcome those challenges? Uh, but also even just. You know, the, the bigger the obstacle, the harder the thing you go through, the, the stronger you're going to be on the other side, the, the more rewarding the, the benefits are on the other side of it. And so just trying to get guys to understand that, hey, when we see an obstacle coming, when we have real adversity come to us, this is just another opportunity. Um, you know, I had a coach who say all the time, obstacles are just opportunities and work clothes. And uh, I think if you can kind of get guys buying into that before it happens, and then when it does happen, you say, hey, we knew it was coming, right? Now let's figure out. Right. We're, we're not looking for a way out. We're looking for a way over. Let's figure it out. Absolutely. And I believe that when you prepare your team like that um, and you do find an obstacle and you overcome it, it builds your team and brings them stronger together. That's at least what I've experienced. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I love doing it even in practice when we would do situational stuff. I would mm -hmm. always call a penalty at the worst moment or I would always uh, <laughs> have the equipment infraction. Somebody's knee pads. We're in shells and I'd say hey, their knee pads will cover their knees. He's out. <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, that's the, the get them used to those situations where you got to figure it out. I love that, coach. Perfect. Um, so, coach, speaking of situations, I'm going to kind of go to a little bit of football here. How much when you guys were practicing, did you do situational stuff in practice? Was it a big part of it? Was it a little piece? Was it a certain day? We, we got to more and more of it as we went on. That was one of the things that I really appreciated that I learned um, as a coach. I don't even remember where I got this idea, but probably about 10 years in, we started doing idea meetings uh, where uh, at the beginning of the winter, uh, we'd sit down and I'd tell all the coaches, all right, you got to come in with something that we do well, but we could do better or something that we need to change, whether it's equipment, whether it's you know, we started filming uh, practice with drones because, uh, you know, all the different shots that you could get, you know, so oh, yeah. you know, whether it was something like that or uh, one of the coaches at one point talked about us not uh, starting off great. Uh, and so uh, we were kind of that that year, for whatever reason, we were notoriously slow starters in the first quarter. So we started right after stretch and we do a competition. Uh, and so it was, you know, goal line or two point or coming out in you know, tough territory or something like that. Um and then we started doing uh, more overtime things. Uh, at the end of practice, we would do some sort of weird situation thing uh, that um, might not come up very often, but we would try and do a, a regular two-minute drill. But then we'd also do, um, you know, right before the half, you know, trying to do that middle eight or something like that. Um, yeah. You know, and, and just try and come up with weird, weird situations that, uh, um, you know, make them ready for it. But also a big part of it was just that mental toughness of, you know, getting comfortable being uncomfortable, like they say all the time. Coach, I'm, you know, I, I know we're talking about culture and team building, but there's been something I've been wanting to ask you maybe for about the last decade. How much do you guys practice in a trip set running zone stick? <laughs> we, we do it a lot. You know, one, one of the things um, I, I learned a while ago, particularly because you know, we were a triple option team when we first started and that kind of evolved into the RQ stuff. <laughs> um <clears throat> but uh, I, I think it's really important that your QB read at least 80% of the practice uh, that, um, you know, th there are going to be some things that where you're working on, you know, just what we call pad drill, playing another down where you're know, working on getting down and keeping the ball protected and doing things like that, or just some throwing mechanic stuff. But we really wanted at least 80% of the practice where he was having to make a read. So we got away from doing as much of uh, just routes on air type stuff and started doing two on one where it was, you know, Arrow slant or arrow bubble, or I'm sorry, bubble slant 
and reading the flat defender or reading, uh, you know, the, the corner on a, on an out fade, throwing the hole, um, and you know, trying to get to as many of those reads as possible. Uh, and so then we started doing it, you know, where we do two on ones and we would do half field. So even when we were practicing draw, that was one of my favorite ways to, to run stick. You know, we'd swing the back out and run draw, read the mic. Uh, and, um, <laughs> you know, we would do it in, in units and, you know, do a 10 minute practice segment like that. Just as many of those reads as we could get. Yeah, coach. I, uh, <laughs> that stick still gives me nightmares. Uh, as well, much it's, as some, <laughs> it's something that if you get good at running it and good at a fish, very efficient at it, that's tough to stop. That puts linebackers in, in a, in a bind. Well, and the, you know, because you can do things like, uh, you know, just having a, a bubble or a now screen on the backside of it and then, you know, swinging, it really makes them defend all 53 and a third, you know? So, yeah, I mean, there's, I go back to the, the one year we're playing y'all maybe in 2017 is one of the best defenses we ever had at Oak Leaf. And, we hold you guys to, to a really low output for what you guys are normal, normally do in a, a regular season. You guys are always 40 plus and it's the end of the game. It's third and four. And I'm screaming like they're throwing stick and I'm telling the safety we're in many, but I'm like, just tighten up and just look, just go. I was like, if the guy double moves you, I'll, I'll take it. And our safety just, I mean, he comes downhill perfectly and you guys still throw sticks so perfectly. The kid, it's low and outside. He just, you know, kind of goes down the fetal position and catches it to win the game. And I'm like, to this day, I'm like, I cannot believe they still threw stick in that moment. We knew it was coming. We still couldn't stop it. Like, coach, I, I still talk about that. I'm like, Bartram throws stick better than any program I've ever been around. And it's so infuriating how much we couldn't stop that. So I didn't mean to get too far off the culture thing there. No, no, just, you're, you're fine. I thought you were actually going to talk. There was a, the, the one year where we had, uh, I want to say it was like a fourth and two and we threw a fade. Uh, and, uh, it was because it was part of the, the, the read and our, you know, our QB took it and it was one of those where I'm like, no, oh, yes. You know, <laughs> like, and they're, they're actually asking me, uh, afterwards, you know, like, that was a really gutsy call. And I was like, I agree. Go talk to our QB. <laughs> that was the, that but, was the uh, year after, in case you're wondering, I, I remember yeah. that one too. <laughs> so, that's a lot you know, of trust that's, in the quarterback. And that, that's because we had great QBs. We had young men that I knew had put in the, yes. the time and the work and the film study, uh, where, uh, you know, th- those guys made, made plays, play after play after play, and just, you know, you could, you could trust them. Coach, how many of those quarterbacks went Division One or FCS or better? You, you guys had, it seemed like you had one for 10 years. Yeah, we had, we were, we were blessed. We had a lot of really good ones. Uh, and, uh, you know, gosh, I, I can't even count. Uh, just, it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, right. You know, there was he, a, the kid that went to Clemson, there's Nathan Peterman, there was, you know, this kid now is going, where's the, where's the current kid going? Uh, UCF. Rivals? He's going to yeah. UCF. Oh, there you go, Matt. He's going wow. to UCF. Just yeah. for you. And it, it's like every year we're like, here's another Bartram kid who's committed somewhere. Like, this is so frustrating how much talent these guys have at the quarterback position and how well every dead last one of them ran the triple and threw stick and did all those little things. And we're just like, did we ever get a break from this? So it's just <laughs> Well, it was funny. They they uh <laughs> some somebody at one point asked me like what we did for training QBs and they thought we had some, you know, magic <laughs> thing that we were doing. We we're like, we built the school in the right spot because <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the kids live here and they you know, it, it was funny, it was just one after the next. They just uh it was you know, great place to be. And it is, and you that know, sounds- really in St. John's County, it's it's a pretty big QB county. I mean, when I look back through it, there's been a lot of darn good QBs that have come through here. We've had a Mr. Football winner that played QB in the county yep. uh, recently at Ponte Vedra. So it's, it's pretty amazing how good the quarterback play is in this county. So let's get yeah, Bishop back. King's had a few. Yeah. Yes, they have. That's my alma mater. So, you know, there have been a few, not me, but there have been some really other good ones. Johnny Wofford, obviously, and, uh, and Stuckel and some of those guys. So, uh, Matt, I think we're kicking it back to you. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Let's get back to the team culture uh, talk. <laughs> so, Coach, over 30 years coaching um, – what significant shifts or evolutions or changes did you see in team culture over those 30 years? You know, not many coaches get to see that amount of time at one school uh, as what you saw at Bartram Trail. So really, what significant shifts or evolution in the team culture did you see? Yeah, you know, I, th- I think it's just, you know, every year there's new developments and whether it's, you know, social media or whether it was highlight tapes or whether it was, you know, I- any of the things just throughout the years, it's kind of getting used to and adapting to what's out there that's distracting guys. Um, you know, that, uh, um, you know, right now it's tough just because there is so much uh, out there that's trying to pull them away uh, and trying to make it about, 
things other than what we're telling them about, you know, team before self or, you know, uh, you know, doing the right thing, even when nobody's watching and, uh, you know, that there's a lot of distraction out there that's right there readily at their fingertips. Uh, and so just recognizing that and, and trying to adapt your message to make it a little bit more approachable and digestible for them. So you're saying you're on TikTok, coach? <laughs> I am, I'm not. My uh, my athletic director asked me to to uh, get on uh, Twitter at one point, and I was like, I couldn't do it. There's, I was like, there's so much negative stuff. I, I like, I made an account, but I can't get on there. <laughs> you know, just we found uh, you and tagged you in case you're wondering. So it's it's tagged on there, but uh, that's funny. We, we did find you. Um, so effective communication is clearly a, a vital part of this entire thing that we've talked about over and over. So how have you found effective communication ways for kids, just like Matt said, that we've changed over time, right? Kids are so different now than they were 10 years ago and 20 years ago. How has that communication style changed for you? Well, I think, you know, one, just the resources that are there, you know, we used to do a, a physical champions manual or as a three ring binder and it was a week at a glance. And I, <laughs> I'd actually thought about going back to that, uh, just kind of going old school uh, at the end. But then we, uh, started finding a few of those in the locker at the end of the year that had never been used. <laughs> and so we figured we needed to try and find a different way of doing it. And, uh, um, uh, Chad Parker, who's now the head coach at Fleming, um, he's much more tech savvy than I was. So we figured out a way to put it on our school, uh, program Schoology that the, the students already had to be on for all their other classes. Uh, and so just finding ways to do things like that, uh, you know, kind of meet them where they are, I uh, still try and give them the resources. I actually, there were some nice things about that because now instead of just, I always liked including, uh, you know, like a, a poem or a story, an article about something. It gave an opportunity to include videos and things as well. Yeah. Uh, so just finding ways to do things like that. Um, one of the things that I felt like we started to do a little better job too was uh, putting more on the player leaders, you know, so saying, all right, your position group, I'm only giving it to you guys. You have to give it to your position group. And just so making it so that they had like to take that. some of that ownership of their group and their leadership and the communication. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I coach, I love that. Matt, write that one down. I got it. That's our, our note taker. I, I keep the notes. <laughs> hey, uh, coach, um, you know, we always talk about, you know, I always used to talk to my players about leaving something better than what you got it. Obviously, you being the first real coach there at Bartram Trail, um, looking back, what, what steps did you take to ensure that your legacy would that you built would continue? Not specifically your legacy, but just the program's legacy would continue after your departure there. Um, you know, I, I think the big thing is just you know pouring into the coaches that were still there, and I, I tell you, uh, Bartram got it right with uh, Corey Johns. They they hired a great guy. Uh, he is he is doing a fantastic job, and the uh, the future's in really good hands there. Um. But I, th I think just, you know, trying to make sure that I was helping the coaches grow so that they could continue their vision with it. Um, you know, that was um, my purpose statement as a, as a coach, as a, you know, for me personally, was to try and build young men that were going to be great husbands, fathers, community leaders. And then the second part was to help the coaches and give them the resources so that they could instill their passion and their purpose. Uh, and so I tried to really do that with the coaches and, and building them up to a point where um, they're, they're taking it and running with it. Yeah, absolutely. Coach, are there any traditions there at Bartram that you're very fond of that, that they still do or anything like that? Um, yeah. You know, coach John's did, did a really, he, he didn't need to do a lot of the things that he did as far as trying to keep me involved or trying to keep some of the things involved. You know, he, he definitely put his own stamp on it, but there were other things that he felt like, uh, I, I think fit his philosophy as well. Um, you know, one of the things that we started a few years back that I really like is we do an honor game. And so one of the games we pick, uh, and we honor either, uh, a milit we do a military appreciation game, a first responders appreciation game, or a fight cancer game. Uh, and, um, we get special jerseys. Uh, BSN was great to us and helped us work out different jerseys each year. Uh, and then somebody in the community, if they had, you know, for like the, the fight cancer game, if they had somebody that they wanted to honor and recognize, they could buy a jersey. And so for a hundred bucks, they would get that person's name on the back of their jersey. Uh, and then the day of the game, they would actually come to the team meal and they would sit down with the player that was going to wear that person's name on their jersey. Uh, and that was one of the coolest things ever uh, to sit 
watch the guys sitting and, and uh, you know, I can still picture um, one of the guys, one of the receivers sitting with a, a woman who uh, uh, had unfortunately lost her, her daughter to cancer. Uh, and by the end of the meal, they were both crying and hugging and sharing recipes with each other. I don't know how to turn to that part of it, uh, but uh, um, it was just awesome. And to watch the guys at the end, we, you know, it, at the end of the meal, they were to look across the table and say, hey, you know, I can't guarantee that we're going to win, but I can guarantee you I'm going to honor this name on the back of my jersey. My attitude, my effort, I'm going to give everything I've got. And I'm going to honor their fight with my fight. Uh, and um, and then at the end of the game, those people would come down on the field and our players would take the jersey off and give it to them. Uh, and, um, and then any money that we had left went to some you know, charity that – uh, like for that one, there was a, a dream big foundation that paid for travel for families, uh, for, uh, you know, for hospital visits and things. Um, and, uh, so we, we did that for a number of years and went through the cycle of those three different games, uh, a few, you know, a couple of times, I guess. And, uh, coach yeah. John's kept that going this year and it was really neat to see it going. Coach, that, bumps. Yeah, it does. It, it was awesome. I, and, and just, I tell you, I loved the, the after the game, the guys giving them the jersey and everything. But my favorite part was the meal and just getting to walk around and kind of be a fly on the wall and listen to the conversations. Our guys did such an awesome job of paying attention and being engaged and being respectful and and really trying to honor people. It, it was it was neat. Yeah, coach, that's kind of near and dear to our heart too. Uh, I don't know if you can see the hat that Matt's wearing, but that's uh, one of our good friends. He was the OC at Oviedo uh, when me and Matt were there. Matt was that coach. He passed away from cancer, and we hmm. still do the Tyler Lampy Foundation to this day. We just did the golf tournament for him. So listening to a coach doing something special like that kind of uh, almost brought me to tears just listening to you talk about that because that's the first thing that went to my mind was how cool would it be to have Tyler's name on the back of a jersey yeah, you know, that's one cool. more time and, and see that in football. So that is, that's an amazing thing, and, and that alone is probably, if you're listening to this podcast, that alone is something you should take away and maybe the best thing we've heard since we started this podcast. So that that might be my favorite thing I've heard so far yeah. on this podcast. That is incredible coach. It's well, awesome I, it's, it's, it's awesome <laughs> to watch guys. Cause we always talk about, you know, being a part of something bigger than yourself and, and, and things like that. And for them to be able to see it in a real tangible way like that, uh, it was an, an idea I got from a friend up North and, uh, um, we, we kind of took it and tailored it to our community and it's, it's been a great thing. Coaches steal that. If you're listening, just take yeah, it. for sure. It's, it's awesome. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, that, that may ruin our last question, Matt. But uh, <laughs> that might. I think that does. <laughs> it could, but we'll, we'll ask it anyways later on. <clears throat> All right, so Coach, um, beyond the game, because you've talked about this so much, how did you approach that holistic development of players as individuals and kind of really contributing to the character and life skills? I, I know this is something you talk about all the time. I've heard you talk about it, but I'd love for our audience to hear about what you do with your players for that. Well, and I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk about it. Um, you know, one of the things we would do as a staff during the summer, we would meet and go, we don't want to just assume that we're, you know, all, all thinking the same thing, but let's make it a discussion every time. And so we would discuss what are the traits that we want our players to graduate with? You know, when a young man graduates from Bartram, what do we want him to be? What do we want him to look like? How do we want to help him think? How do we want to help him uh, be prepared for whatever it is that he does next? Uh, and we wanted to make sure that it was every player. That uh, it wasn't just the guys going on to play college football, but every single player that came through Bartram, we wanted to make sure that we were doing something to help him grow as a man, help him be prepared. Like I said, my personal mission to be a, a better husband, father, community leader. Uh, but whatever he's going to do after high school football, we want to help prepare him for it. Uh, and so we would sit down and think about, all right, what are the traits that we want to make sure? Um, you know, we want to seize teachable moments. And, uh, you know, if, if something comes up, you know, if uh, somebody drops a piece of trash on the ground, we want to go over and pick it up. And people th th recognize, hey, we're doing that because we want to leave places better than we found it, as you as you had said, Coach. Um, if, uh, you know, we're doing warm-up lines uh, and a guy doesn't finish through, well, we want to stop practice and go, hey, if we don't finish through, if we don't do plus one past the line, what are we practicing? <laughs> somebody will finally get, well, we're quitting. All right, so are we going to practice quitting every single day? Or are we going to practice finishing every single day? And so you'll have those teachable moments, but we also wanted to make sure that we get, didn't get to the end of the season and not have hit on some things that we really want to make sure that our guys know. So we would come up with, you know, all 15 topics. Lord willing, we, you know, if we made it to a state championship game, we wouldn't have a topic already planned. Uh, so we'd have 15 topics for each week of the season. Uh, and we would, you know, integrity, um, character, teamwork, service leadership, servant leadership, 
approaching success and defeat the, uh, with the same type of, uh, you know, uh, dignity and work ethic. Um, and so we would come up with our 15 themes and then each coach would pick a theme and then he would be the one that would present it that week. Uh, and then what we would do is have our players council guys pick the themes that they liked and we wouldn't tell them which coach had already picked it. And then they'd <laughs> pair up with that coach. And so the coach would address the team on Monday at our team meeting before practice and kind of introduce the theme. And then the player Wednesday after practice uh, would address the team about the same theme. It's just a way of helping ensure that we, we got all the topics covered that we wanted to make sure we hit. Yeah, that's such a cool thing. And funny enough, he won't talk about it, but that reminds me a lot of what Coach Dixon was doing at Oviedo when I was there. He had morning meetings with the kids and oh, what did you do? Was it, was it the Beatitudes or it was something like that? I'm not sure what it was, Matt. It was a book or something that you guys did. It was really cool. Yeah, it was basically a book that took uh, images and tied it with ideas like that. So each week there would be a, a certain focus. And, um, you know, there was, there was different images that went with each concept. So it kind of gave the kids a visual. Um, and we could put up uh, that visual for the week as our background for everything we did. Um, so, so I really love that stuff, Coach. That's, uh, that's awesome. That's cool. I like I the idea of the image. Yeah, so I always felt that uh, students, students, I do it in my classroom as well. If we have vocabulary or something in math, I make sure that there's an image with it that, that kind of ties to it that helps connect them with that. I think students, uh, players are always visual learners. Um, Coach, I really liked about what you talked about there with your team culture and, and developing the health of it. Um, and you get to the end of the year. Did you have any metric or any different way to measure um, – you know, once again, I'm a math teacher. So is there any way you had to measure or look at or evaluate at the end of the year, really how that program worked? Um, you know, we, we actually looked at that. University of Georgia had been doing the thing for a while with a pre-test and a post-test and doing some of that stuff. Uh, but we really never got to that point. Um, it was really more at the end of the year, we would do um, the postseason surveys with the guys. And then with uh, the seniors, I would meet with the outgoing seniors. Uh, cause I felt like those guys would obviously, um, ha had a, a little more freedom to be honest. Uh, and they would say, what were some of the best things that you, you take away from the here? What, what are some things you think we could do a little bit better? What are some things that made it a great experience? What's something you're going to remember? What's something you wish you wouldn't remember? You know, those types of things, <laughs> uh, with the returning players, they would meet with their position coach and we would tie it in as a goal meeting also. Uh, and so just kind of, um, evaluating not only what we want to do in the weight room and what we want to do for a second sport or any of those types of things, but also those character traits, they would rate themselves and the position coach would rate them on how are you on integrity? How are you on teamwork? How are you on these things? And it was made for a great conversation because the two scores didn't necessarily, you know, fit with each other, the, the way the coach looked at it and the way the player looked at it. So it gave an opportunity to discuss it uh, and then make some goals in those areas as well. Perfect. I, that's Matt's always trying to quantify things, which is what makes him good. He is the more analytical of the two of us, um, even though I'm super A type. I'm the one that gets all angry and fired up. Um, <laughs> so, so coach, we're going to look upon all of this, all of these years of, of knowledge that you have. And if you had to give one piece of advice to a young head coach at this point in your career, what would that piece of advice be? Well, can I do a part A and a part B? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think that the first part of it is, is the idea that um, recognizing that um, God's got you there for a purpose and it goes way beyond scores. And, you know, I, I tell people all the time, my win loss record is not going on my tombstone. So that's obviously not <laughs> what's most important to me. Uh, so being able to, to prioritize and really keep focused on the development of young men and and keep praying about it. Uh, you know, I, I think it takes some divine intervention to get through some of the things that are presented uh, throughout the course of a season and throughout the course of a career. Uh, and then part B of that would be uh, really prioritizing your family. Uh, that um, it, at the end of the day, the guys, you know, there, there's really a, a couple of things that are going to come out of that. One, that that's your strength and your backbone, just like your faith is. So much time away. Uh, if uh, if they're not feeling this, the same love that you're giving your players, uh, <laughs> it's a recipe for disaster. Um, but uh, also, I think it's a great opportunity for guys to see you as something other than just coach. 
you know, I really wanted our coaches to have their, their wives come to events that I really wanted them to have their kids there on campus. Uh, we all the time had kids that were, uh, ball boys or, um, you know, that helped with the water or helped do anything. And just to have them, the players see the coaches as husbands and fathers that there there's, I think there's no stronger lesson, uh, that, you know, than, than showing them it. Yeah, no, coach, I, you know, early in my career, I was, came from, you know, the college realm of being around all those hard nosed guys. And I was trying to be that guy of like, look, we're all about discipline. We're this and that. And then late in my career, it was like, look, if you just relax and be yourself, you find out that things get a lot easier with kids. Yeah. And so there's nothing more true than that. Like, let them see you as a person because that's going to do a lot more for your team bonding than see you as this super authoritative figure that's always hammering them and coming down on them. So that's a, such a great point. And obviously for coaches out there, the family thing is a huge piece of it. Uh, there's a reason why I'm not coaching right now. And it's not the only reason, but one of them is I have a two-year-old daughter and uh, I want to spend plenty of time with her. So that's a, that's a awesome. piece of it. Yeah. Um, hey, Coach Brett, Coach Brever, I want to, I want to point something out here. <laughs> Amazing parallels between what Coach Sutherland with over 30 years coaching experience and Coach Peterson that we had on at the beginning of this season um, from Middle Tennessee Christian, first-year head coach. Um, just amazing parallels there, talking about wanting to see the team, wanting the team to see him as a family man. Absolutely incredible stuff. And it's funny that two coaches in different points of their careers, absolute opposite ends, oh, yeah. come in and say the, say the same thing. And Coach Sutherland, it was a really cool one with uh, Petey, who we know. Uh, we call him Petey. He was a first year head coach and actually won the state championship as a first year head coach. So it was That's a awesome. pretty wild ride for him. Um, so I got two more questions for you, coach. One of them is, is maybe a tough one for you, but uh, how hard was it to walk away? It, you know, really difficult because uh, one, I don't like letting people down, um, you know, and uh, um, you know, the, 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 the program's in great shape. Like I said, you know, coach Johns is, he's the right guy for the job. The, the coaches that are, that are there are fantastic men. Um, I, you know, I miss the relationships, uh, but it, it, as far as me being able to step back and, you know, I wanted, we wanted to be able to go and um, watch our youngest son play. Um, we wanted to be able to be involved with our, our parents are living in the area. We wanted to be able to be around them a, a little bit more. Um, you know, really love my wife. I think she's awesome. I like spending time with her. Uh, so we actually got to go up and watch a couple games up in West Virginia this fall and, uh, took a long weekend to do it and really enjoyed it. So, um, you know, there are parts of it. I, I really miss the relationships. The guys have done a great job of trying to swing by my classroom and make me still feel like I'm involved some. Yeah. But, uh, um, the, the, the trade's been, it was the right time. No, absolutely. And, and coach, I, I know you know this, but. I don't think I've been around too many guys that are spoken more highly of than you. Um, even even after you know you you stepped away from the program, I still hear assistant coaches talk about you and how awesome it was. And um, you know we have a mutual. Well, that's friend. humbling. I, I appreciate you sharing that. We have a mutual friend that I talk to all the time, and I think every text message conversation we have, he goes, "Well, this is what Coach Sutherland said, and this is what he would have done." So it's it's amazing to see your impact on other coaches. So um, we always end the podcast with the same question. Uh, and you may have already answered it, and you can default back to that answer if you'd like. But we all we always ask coaches, what's the best thing your program does that no one knows about? Or what's the most unique thing that your program does that no one knows about that they could learn from? Huh. Well, um, it's such a loaded question. We always have yeah, time to think. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I don't know that there's does. anything that's necessarily unique. Uh, that was one of the things. It was funny when I first started coaching, I thought I was, uh, you know, <laughs> on the cutting edge offensively and came up with something that I, you know, this one play – uh, that was actually kind of an RPO. It was out of triple option, but you could throw to the slot or give, you know, and, and you know, yeah. I thought I was really, you know, coming up with something. <laughs> and then I found it in uh, Tiger Ellison run and shoot the now attack from 1970. <laughs> and uh, it was the exact same play. And I was like, yeah, that's uh, I'm not very original, I guess. But, uh, you know, so I don't know that I, there was anything necessarily unique that we did. One of my favorite things that we did was uh, our senior ceremony, uh, the the senior night game. We would give the guys a card, and they would write on it. Uh, they had two questions: What does it mean to, to be a bar, you know, to be a Bartram Trail Bear, and what's the legacy I want to leave? Um, and so they would write those. I wanted them to think about it in advance, and then before practice that Thursday, uh, right before the the senior game, we would go on the field, uh, and they would say what they were 
you know, what was on their card. And we, we videotaped it so that could be part of the, the senior video that they would have. But then we also had a football that we would cut open. And the, the guys, as they would share it, they would then put it in the football. And so we'd have all the seniors speak. Uh, the rest of the team would get a chance to hear them. And they're always really emotional. They, I was just, always just amazed at the maturity of, of these guys and the things that they would share. Uh, and then we would bury the football there in the end zone or right, or actually right behind the end zone. Uh, so the, our grounds crew was always great. They'd always have a hole for us already. <laughs> the guys would take the football and they were literally leaving part of themselves there on the field. They would all get the shovels and bury it back in and then we'd, we'd go out and practice. So I just, I thought it was a, a, a cool way to give them the opportunity to talk to their teammates in a way that uh, um, maybe they hadn't done before. Yeah, it's pretty awesome, coach. And for those of you listening, uh, Bartram Trail has a huge turf management program there. So <laughs> yeah. it was probably a big deal to make sure everything was dug up and planted back correctly and everything. They, they even have their own Twitter from what I've seen where it's like the Bartram Trail turf Twitter or whatever it is. So they, they do an always, awesome job. You know, they do you an kind awesome of giggle job. at it when you're on the outside, but on the inside, it's really cool to have a, a whole place dedicated to the football field being stellar. Um, there's a lot of places, especially around Jacksonville, that wish their football field looked that good on, on most Friday nights. So, <clears throat> well, coach, um, before we sign off here, uh, just letting everybody know listening again, if you want to contact us, if you have any questions you'd like us to pass on to Coach Sutherland, you can reach out to us at theboardrill at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter at boardrillpod. Uh, we're on TikTok, Instagram, boardrill podcast, probably every medium you have. Uh, you'll see cut ups of coaches. All of our talks, you can access us on, on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, pretty much every medium we make available. Uh, but, Coach, before we go, me and Matt want to give a big congratulations to you. You were just inducted to the FACA Hall of Fame, and I don't know if there's anyone more deserving in the area. So, Coach, congratulations from us to you. Well, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> I tell you, it was, it was, it's incredibly humbling to represent the all the people that – they really deserve the credit for. I get way too much credit for a whole bunch of people's <laughs> hard work. But, uh, you know, when you think of the, the players that we were talking about, the coaching staff, the administration, everybody that's, uh, that's poured into making Bartram Trail what it is, uh, you know, to, to get to be a part of that's been awesome. That's fantastic, Coach. Well, Coach, thanks again for coming on the Board Drill Podcast. And uh, we appreciate everything you do. And we hope maybe in the future we can get you on and, and you can teach me a little bit of that, that, uh, that triple option and some of the secrets that I can never figure out while I was coaching against you. <laughs> I appreciate you guys having me. Re really enjoyed it. We'll probably see you again at the uh, Playbook Clinic coming up here. Oh, that's right. I forgot to mention that. Matt, you want to go ahead and talk about that? Yeah, Playbook Can Clinic coming to Orlando. I believe that's in... It's January 19th through 21st. January 19th through 21st in Orlando, really Altamont Springs. So um, hope to see you there, Coach. And I know we'll be there. We'll have our podcast uh, set up and interviewing coaches, talking some ball. Sounds great. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, for us signing off, thank you, coach. Have a great night. Thank you, guys. Bye.